So thank you very much. I'm Daniel Franklin from The Economist. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Skoll for wonderful collaboration on, on this session. Delighted to be here. Uh, I'm asked, as all moderators have to ask you, please turn off your mobile phones, but feel free to tweet or engage in social media during the session. Uh, our focus here, I, I guess, uh, social entrepreneurship is all about uh, trying to make the future better. So our focus here is all about looking at uh, a longer term future, the next 25 years or so, uh, and to try and peer, do the impossible job of peering into what it might look like and what we might do to influence it. Uh, and just as a, 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 a little taster at the beginning, we're going to show two very short clips. Uh, we took our cameras to two places that are in different ways, very different ways, at the frontier of the future. So here we go, first of all, let's take a look. That's a little farther, farther out, but I also am hopeful, hopeful and, and I'm seeing, seeing that we're probably going to find ways in order to uh, uh, perhaps colonize, colonize space. space and, and be interacting with the space environment, environment more, and, and that, that, that will change our, our global, global perspective quite a bit. I believe, I believe Antarctica, Antarctica actually will become more accessible to the general population, population not, not just researchers, researchers and not, not just explorers. Um, people will uh, see more of Antarctica and experience Antarctica in, in more of a first-hand way than they've ever done before. That'll be, that'll be easily done in, in you know, 30 years or so. So it'll be, it'll be a continent that's not so isolated so much anymore. With that, there's probably going to be some social political uh, ramifications that are, have to be dealt with in 30 years. The past five years have already seen a big change here, so it is impossible to think what it will be like in 25 years. This is Shanghai, by the way. I can only imagine it will be very good. In 25 years, these buildings will probably have to be torn down to expand the roads. The roads are too narrow here. China will be number one. It will take the place of the U.S. I think that all of China and all the world will be destroyed in the future. In <laughs> 25 years, the rich will get richer, the poor will get poor, and I think that the world economy will shift towards Asia. As it develops, the Asian economy will be doing better. If the Earth is still here in 25 years, I hope that we can feel free to do whatever we want. And we can have the aliens take us traveling if they choose us. I just hope they don't destroy us. I hope in 25 years my child will be able to enjoy his life. I want him to be peaceful and healthy. I don't hope that he lives an extravagant lifestyle. Actually, for those of us migrants, our biggest wish is just to be able to go home soon. In 25 years, I think it will still be peaceful in China, not like other countries. As long as every country minds their own business, it will be fine. 25 years from now, China will definitely be the strongest in the world. I know this because we believe in ourselves. You can't say who will be a world leader in 25 years. You have to look at how democratic advanced and unified the country can become. Every country is the same. It's just how well they compete in a peaceful world.
Well, I think some fascinating uh, views there. I love the way that the youngest person shown is the most pessimistic, <laughs> the way, sort of slightly changes the stereotype. So um, what I am, I'm going to do uh, in the next 10 to 15 minutes is give a view of a sort of framework for, um, for, the, for the next 25 years, some of the big themes that seem to me to be important uh, in thinking about the next 25 years. And then we're going to have two further uh, short presentations and then a panel discussion uh, in which I hope that um, all of you will take, take part as well. So that's, that's what we're going to do. Um, a quick look at some of, the, uh, some of the themes for the next 25 years, 10 of them very quickly. First of all, the economy, as you might expect from The Economist. This is a notional E7, emerging market seven country growth versus the G7 rich country growth. The blue line at the top, the emerging markets, uh, the uh, red one at the bottom, the rich world. And it just shows what you all know, that the expected, the likely course of growth over the coming uh, 25, 30 years is going to be much more rapid growth in the emerging markets. This was a chart from The Economist um, a few months ago, and I think it's very enlightening. It shows that, in a way, this pattern that you're seeing, the rise of Asia that you heard that person from Shanghai talking about, is uh, a return to normality, that for most of human history, Asia was actually by far the biggest uh, economic area in the world. You then had the Industrial Revolution. You have, first of all, uh, Europe and then the United States coming up and Asia falling behind. And now, just in recent times, you have Asia coming up again and returning what you might call to its rightful place uh, as, as uh, the, 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 the most... Uh, 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 sizable chunk of the world economy. I think that's a fascinating uh, long-term long perspective. Within Asia itself, just a reminder, um, this shows this Mount Fuji-like shape shows Japan, uh, which at 20, uh, uh, 30 years ago was soaring up as a share of the uh, US economy, and then it hit the top, the peak of Mount Fuji, if you like, and started to come down, and now you have China coming up, uh, and uh, as you all know, if you've read in the papers just recently, overtaking Japan to become the second biggest economy in the world, and I think there's every prospect uh, that China will continue uh, that pattern and continue to become, actually, uh, uh, right up to overtake America as the world's biggest economy. So uh, Asia becoming the biggest uh, region in the world, but within Asia, lots of change happening as well. Uh, second big theme, and this will be a very familiar one to you, population. Of course, this uh, influences so much of the challenges, the social change going on in the world. This chart shows how quickly the world's population has grown. It was only in around 1800 that the humanity reached 1 billion. Uh, this year we're going to probably pass the landmark of uh, 7 billion and then plateau around um, uh, 9, 9 and a half billion around the middle of the century. So uh, the, the, the period between each successive billion has become drastically uh, shorter. I think this is just interesting to look at very quickly because it shows over the longer period uh, where these people are. And if you look back uh, to 1950, you see Europe was uh, about uh, a, a fifth of the world's population, over a fifth of the world's population. Africa uh, was under a tenth of the world's population. And that's reversing as you look forward. Europe is going to be under a tenth of the world's population, Africa more than a fifth. Actually, Asia's share is... Uh, pretty much uh, stays constant. So the great switch between Europe and Africa in terms of share of population. And then uh, within that, the trends, again, this will be very familiar to you, rapid aging, um, <laughs> huge uh, consequences of that. Um, some countries actually seeing their populations shrink, which is uh, uh, typically in the developed world, in the rich world, but also uh, Russia. We just had results uh, from the latest Russian census, and the dramatic picture is emerging there. Um, and then age dependency ratios changing very rapidly, including in China because of its, um, uh, or influenced heavily, whoops, by its, uh, one, by its, um, by its one-child policy. But at the, in other places, a dramatically different picture of very young population uh, and all the challenges that that brings, and opportunities, but also challenges. 
Uh, a third big theme, again a familiar one to you, globalization. This is just by way of showing that uh, globalization is, I believe, evolving and will continue to evolve. Uh, there have been very, you could very crudely categorize globalization as coming in various stages. It's evolved from uh, a model where Western businesses would go out and do business in uh, the developing world. Now we talk about emerging markets. They're in many cases emerged. And in many cases, it's a question of basing your production wherever the resources are best available, wherever the talent is uh, most available, and wherever uh, it makes most sense. And that can be anywhere in the world to base production. So it's a much more, uh, if you like, uh, genuine phase of true globalization where you can do almost anything anywhere. But um, the future remains uncertain. There could be resistance to that trend and... Uh, you could find anti-globalization trying to put various aspects of this into reverse. Fourth theme is that of freedom. And it's interesting if you look back um, the, in the decades how rapidly the number of countries in the world has actually increased. We sort of uh, take this for granted now, but actually with uh, the end of colonialization and with uh, the collapse of some countries, such as some federations, such as Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, uh, the number of countries grew and the um, freedom uh, in the world, as measured, for example, by Freedom House, also expanded. Um, in recent years, that freedom, uh, according to those measures, has tended to plateau. There's been, in some cases, indeed, a, a sort of falling back of levels of freedom. Um, but I think what's interesting is, is to look into the future and say, well, uh, this process of splitting up countries may still have further to go. And a big open question is, what about the level of freedom uh, in the world? Are we going to continue uh, the recent trend of a plateauing or going backwards? Or, as recent events in the Middle East suggest, are we in for a new era of spreading freedom to, to parts of the world that haven't really experienced it uh, until now? Uh, another huge question is that of war and peace. Perhaps you could say it's uh, one of the most fundamental questions of all. Uh, there's been a big rise in peacekeeping, as you can see from this chart, and that's um, the good flip side of that is there has been a fall generally uh, over the recent decades in the numbers of deaths through conflict uh, in the world. It's not what you would think when you pick up a newspaper in the day, uh, in the morning, uh, probably um, you, you get the opposite impression. But the overall trend actually has been a reduction of deaths through violent conflict. And of course, uh, the great hope would be that that would continue over, that trend would continue over the next 25 years. Social change. Well, this is what you're uh, all about at this forum, but uh, just a couple of covers from recent years in The Economist that show how dramatically things uh, have and are changing. I think... Um, this, a few would have expected to see that sort of cover on The Economist decades ago. Uh, here's another one, perhaps even more important, for affecting change throughout the world, the role of women in the workforce, which has changed dramatically in many parts of the world, half the workforce, more than half the workforce in America, uh, and, and that has the power to uh, uh, change things enormously right around the world. Technology, uh, obviously uh, a, a crucial agent of change. This chart just shows the, the, the crossover point between uh, where mobile uh, telephones overtook landlines, and that's, uh, that's been a, a giant shift enabling all sorts of other social change in the world. Uh, here's a cover that we had recently in The, the Economist uh, talking about 3D manufacturing, which may be a, a coming revolution in the way the, uh, the, the, that uh, uh, industry is organized, which could again have huge repercussions uh, for um, what is done where and how it's done, what becomes possible. So uh, I don't know whether it'll be this but uh, or other areas of technology that will be the most influential. This is to say that uh, technology as a driver of change is obviously going to be absolutely fundamental. Uh, in the corporate world, uh, this is a little playful way of saying that the uh, the rate of change of uh, corporate, um, the corporate hierarchy, if you like, the corporate churn, has, if anything, speeded up. 
and you have companies like Google, like Facebook, uh, like Twitter, which come from almost nowhere to become giants. So this is uh, a little view of the future. Uh, you know, what sort of companies might, you, might be the biggest 10 in the world uh, by then? Well, uh, it's no longer just energy. It's water that is the scarce resource. So you have Exxon Hydro as being the biggest. Uh, Tata uh, manages to buy Microsoft. So you have Tata Soft. Uh, the sovereign wealth funds are hugely important. Qatar is uh, actually the fastest growing economy in the world right now, Qatar Holdings. Uh, this company called GGS, formerly known as Google Goldman Sachs, you know, the, uh, China, of course, dominates the world of automotive manufacturing. Then you have, I won't even bother to pronounce that, but it's the logical extension of what you see in the pharmaceutical world. Education, hugely uh, important, and these are the two giants getting together, Ox Oxbridge, ha Harvard. McTwitter, well, McDonald's realized that uh, burgers weren't really the way of the future, so they had to get tweeting, and McTwitter was the result. Uh, Apple and News Corp got together, and of course, Hollywood and Disney is the logical end of the uh, entertainment uh, world. Um, Global warming, uh, climate change generally, I, 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 I uh, can't, sorry, can't uh, talk about big themes in the world without mentioning it. And I think um, whatever you think will happen there, the, the, the world is going over the next 25 years to be very busy either with trying to reduce uh, climate change uh, or reduce the degree of global warming that uh, may otherwise happen or going to be very busy adapting to the climate change uh, that is happening because we failed to reduce it as much as we, we, had, uh, we had hoped to do so. So obviously, uh, will we have a planet to talk about in the future is uh, absolutely fundamental. And then very uh, lastly, just to show that, uh, uh, of course, 25 years ahead is, is uh, uh, it, it, you know, so much can happen. In uh, the world in 2011, the annual publication from The Economist, which I edit, I, I asked people, because it was our 25th anniversary edition, I asked various thinkers to uh, come up with some ideas for what they thought might uh, happen in 25 years. Here are a few of them. You can see they range from the world being ripe for a major new religion to Usain Bolt saying, well, maybe someone will run uh, 100 meters in nine seconds flat. So there you are. I hardly need to uh, remind you that in this sort of future gazing, there are huge amounts of uncertainty. There's a line on that chart there that says the line of, uh, on that palm there that says the line of humble pie. And a lot that you say, of course, uh, will turn out uh, not to be correct. But that's not going to stop us today. We're going to be prepared to peer into the future. A lot of it, even given the uncertainties, uh, has to do with the way, the mindset that you approach this future with. And I think that, that's a lot to do with what the, uh, this forum is about. And to speak somewhat to that um, in, in the next, for the next 15 minutes or so uh, is Stephen Carver of Cranfield Business School, who uh, has a way of changing the way you think about things. And I think you'll see why in a moment. Stephen. Thank you, Daniel.